responsive reading today is Psalm 91, uh, verses 9 to 16. Whoever goes to the Lord for safety, whoever remains under the protection of the Almighty, You have made the Lord your defender, the Most High your protector. And so no disaster will strike you, no violence will come near your home. God will put his angels in charge of you to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands to keep you from hurting your feet on the stones. You will trample down lions and snakes, fierce lions and poisonous snakes. God says, I will save those who love me, and I will protect those who acknowledge me as Lord. When they call to me, I will answer them. When they are in trouble, I will be with them. I will rescue them and honor them. I will reward them in all life. I will save them. Our reading today is from Romans chapter 10, verses 8 to 13. The heading on uh, chapter 10 of the part we're going to read is Salvation for All. What it says is this God's message is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is the message of faith that we preach. If you confess that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from death, you will be saved. For it is by our faith that we are put right with God. It is by our confession that we are saved. The scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. This includes everyone, because there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles. God is the same Lord of all and richly blesses all who call to him. As the scripture says, everyone who calls out to the Lord for help will be saved. The word of the Lord. Continuing our readings as we turn to the Gospel of Luke, reading from chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. Luke chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. Let's continue to hear the word of God. Jesus returned from the Jordan, full of the Holy Spirit, and was led by the Spirit into the desert, where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. In all that time he ate nothing, so he was hungry when it was over. The devil said to him, If you are God's son, order this stone to turn into bread. But Jesus answered, The scripture says man cannot live on bread alone. And then the devil took him up and showed him in the second all the kingdoms of the world. I will give you all this power and all this wealth, the devil told. It has all been handed over to me, and I can give it to anyone I choose. All this will be yours, then, if you worship me. And Jesus answered, The scripture says, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and set him on the highest point of the temple, and said to him, If you are God's son, throw yourself down from for the scripture says, God will order his angels to take good care of you. It also says, they will hold you up with their hands so that not even your feet will be hurt on the stones. But Jesus answered, the scripture says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil finished tempting Jesus in every way, he left him for a while. May the Lord bless to us this reading of his own Lord. I want to take you to this place. The scriptures invite you to come and to become a part of what they are. So, come to the desert. Come to the, to the wilderness where Jesus was tempted. Go to that place. He left the Jordan River and he went into the wilderness by the Spirit. Now, I need you 
to find a place in that wilderness. The wilderness was in front of one of the mountains. So if you want to go and to stand in the shade of the mountain there someplace, go there and do that. If you want to stand in the heat, <coughs> you want to stand in the heat that is in the sun, go and do that. But put yourself in that place so that you know what it's like to be where Jesus was and to see what the scriptures are really offering to you. To do this is to enter into what Lent is all about. Lent was given to us by the Council of Nicaea in 325. And it was built upon the 40 days in which Jesus was tempted. They turned it into 40 days of teaching and learning and commitment and preparation for baptism at Easter. Thus we have this 40 days of Lent. But it was a time to prepare for life as a Christian. It was very intentional, these 40 days. It was when you became a Christian and were able to enter in to the church of Jesus Christ. And it was built on these 40 days of temptation. Now what was it for Jesus? Jesus was driven by the Holy Spirit into the world. And you notice I'm having a little bit of trouble sitting quite so tight to a pulpit. It's not my normal thing, but we're good. We'll, we'll do it right now. Okay. Forty days of temptation, and you're there. You're going to witness, and you're going to see what Jesus is doing. And the first thing you're going to encounter is that Jesus has just come from his baptism. And he's being guided by the Holy Spirit into this desolate place where you find him. And you look around and you wonder why did he come to this place of all places? Why not to a garden? Why not to a place where there was a stream? Why not to, to any place but this desolate place. Well, it's interesting because that very same desolate place was often thought to be the same place that Elijah went to for his 40 days of fasting. When he was being turned into the great prophet of God. It was often thought to be similar to the place that Moses went when he went and stood before God on the mountain in a desolate place to receive the laws of God. And now you're watching as this one comes in to complete that trinity of people. We had the law, we had the great prophet, and now you have the priest who has come to commune with God, to prepare himself for what is going to come, what his ministry is going to be. And you can't stay there the whole 40 days because it's too hard, but you come back and forth, and you watch. And every once in a while when you're there, you see the devil doing something just to torment and to tease Jesus in some way during that time meditation with God. Trying to throw him off of his focus purely on God and what God wants him to do. But he didn't win. And after that 40 days, verse 2 tells us, after that 40 days, when Jesus was likely looking around for, for a tree, for, for some kind of fruit, for something to eat, Satan came in and I knew that Jesus was so weak, so tired, <clears throat> so hungry, now was the time. Now was the time to turn Jesus and what he had come to be. And he says to him, if you're hungry, 
take this stone, turn it into bread. You can do that. Jesus could do that, couldn't you? Jesus could take that stone and turn it into bread, and his hunger would be satisfied. He could make water pour from a rock. Thirst would be satisfied. But Jesus said, no. No. He would not live by bread alone. He would live by the very word of God. He would not fall to Satan. Because what Satan was trying to do was to make him care for himself. Care for yourself. If he can care for himself, he disobeys what God has sent him there to do. And that was to care for you. If Jesus cared for himself, he would not be able to care for you the way God asked him. So he turned from self to you. And you saw that. And you marveled at that. And you wondered at why would Jesus do that for me? What was it that he was or to be that he endured that? Then Satan took him up on the mountain in the background. I mean, the same mountain he could probably stand in the shade of. And he took him up to the top and he showed him all the world, everything, all the power, all the prestige, everything that was in that world, the people. And the temptation was very simple this time. Jesus knew that Satan was Lord over all temporal things. It was a power that had been given to him by the people of this world. <clears throat> power was given to him by us, the ones that were standing there watching this take place. We had given Satan that power over all things. And Satan said that he would give all that power to Jesus. All he had to do was worship Satan. Bow down before him and worship you're standing there watching Jesus doesn't look any different than you because at that point he truly was the son of man and he looked just like you and he had the same thoughts and feelings and ideals that we transposed upon him except for the fact that Jesus didn't feel that way. he knew something he knew that to, to give power and authority to Satan was to remove it from God. So he wouldn't bow down to Satan. Because to bow down to Satan meant that all he had come to do would be defaulted. Because what he came to do was to restore you to a relationship with God. In spite of all that we had given over to Satan, Jesus was saying, I'm going to give these people the opportunity to come back to God. So he refused that temptation of Christ. It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and Him only shall you save. The pinnacle, the testing of God. Now, as you're standing there watching, this one looks really familiar to you. Because you know this one. You know the scripture. Even Satan knows the scriptures. Because Jesus had quoted scripture to him twice in the first two temptations. But this time, Satan is thrown back at him. And he starts with scripture. Saying, you know as well as I do that God's not going to let anything happen. The angels will keep your feet from striking the rocks. He knows. And he says to him, Jump. Just jump. Test God. God will catch you. The angels will catch you. You'll be kept safe. You won't harm yourself. You will be just fine. Just jump. 
Jesus wouldn't have done. But it's interesting if you stop and think about it. The fascinating thing is, Satan knew the scriptures. Satan knew what God would do. Satan knew that God would prevail. Satan didn't know that Jesus was going to jump into the very depth of hell. He was. He was going to do it. And he said, But he wouldn't jump to test God. He would do the will of God. And that's hard for us because we see it, but we don't understand it. We want things to be as we want things to be. We want to be in control of who we are, what we are, what we do, what we say, all of those things. Jesus could have done the same thing, but he said, no. The will of God is first and foremost. And you know this. Let me take you a few years into the future and let you hear him in the Garden of Gethsemane. And there, well, what did he say? Not my will, but thine be done. Jesus knew at that point, had he not obeyed the will of God, nothing from that point on would have been as God wanted it to be. And who did he do that for? <coughs> Only for us. Only for us. All of this was in preparation for Jesus' ministry. He'd been filled by the Holy Spirit and was put into that wilderness. And even at the lowest point of his physical endurance, he resisted the temptations. And he set out on his ministry of reconciliation and restoration. He set out on a ministry of salvation, of healing, of love, and of grace. Now, we know this story, don't we? How many times have you heard the story of the temptations? Sometimes when I ask questions, I really don't care if you answer me. I just want you to think about it. <laughs> Sometimes when I ask a question, um, feel free to answer. Okay. So how many times have you... Has anybody here ever heard this story before today? <laughs> One or two of you have. Good. <laughs> Why do you suppose, then, that it's in Scripture? Is it only for us to say, oh wow, Jesus really resisted temptation? You think? Huh? No. Why is it there? He did it for us, but he also put that story in the scriptures because it becomes our story. Yeah. You were there. Remember? You went there. You watched this. You were there. This becomes your story. It's his example for you. So we look at the narrative. We look at this story that's been printed there for us. And we wonder... What's it offer to us right now, right here, today? Think it's got anything there for us? Let me try this. Have you ever relied upon your own ability? Mm -hmm. Do we ever forget sometimes that we live by the Word of God, which is... Jesus Christ. Some of you will be of the, of the generation that knows what WWJD means. Right? Everybody know that one? Anybody who doesn't know that one? WWJD? You know that one? No, 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 no. Okay. 
Okay, everybody together. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Okay. Do we ever forget that? And do we live on our own terms? Our own abilities? Our own desires? Do we forget that we live by the Word of God? Well, that's the first temptation. Jesus Christ overcame it for you. Can you overcome it for another? Do we try to be the one that is in control instead of directing people to God? <clears throat> A little hard for this one to contemplate, but think about it. Do we try to be the one who is in control instead of directing people do we try to be the one with all the answers, with all of the decision making, with all of the power to do what we think should be done? And I'll, I'll narrow that down for you, make it easier, and show you that maybe we want to do that in our own little corner of this world, in, in, in the spot where we live, or the job that we do, or the task that we try to accomplish, and we do it all because that's us. We wouldn't do that. No one's agreeing with me? <laughs> or do we allow ourselves to live under the guidance and the care of God and allow God to direct and channel us to where we need to be? Sometimes it means stepping out with a little bit of faith. It means stepping out and doing what we're not sure of but being obedient to the will of God and God's purpose in our lives. Okay? The last temptation, <clears throat> and I know none of you ever fall to this one. You already know what it is, don't you? Yeah. Do you ever put God to the test? God, just, just, just give me a sign. A little, you know, part the clouds. If you want me to do this, part the clouds. 